Hello, second graders. Good to see you today. We are celebrating Disney Attire Day for one of our spirit days. And I'm in my Disney attire and I have our Walt Disney World backdrop to enjoy. And we are reading Kittens in the Kitchen. And Mandy is still searching for a home for each of the kittens. Chapter five. Hello, Welford 703267, a woman's voice asked. This is it, Mandy yelped, then lowered her voice to speak into the phone. Yes, this is Welford 703267. She held her breath. Who's speaking, please? She gave her mother a hopeful thumbs up sign. Hello, the voice sounded shy and cautious. There was a long pause. Hello, this is Amanda Hope, who's speaking, please. Mandy made a face of pretend panic at her mom. Hello, I want Welford 703267. The voice seems strange and not used to talking on the telephone. Can I help you please? Mandy said firmly. What was going on here? Her mom had paused over the washing up and was trying to listen in. Did you put a sign in the post office? The woman on the end of the phone asked. Are you the person with the kittens? I am, Mandy said with a grin. I take it you're looking for a kitten? Dr. Emily winked and continued washing the breakfast dishes. There was a long crackly pause. My name is Miss Marjorie Spry. I live at the Riddings. Please come to see me at two o'clock precisely. Then the phone went dead. Well, Dr. Emily said. Relief swept over her as Mandy realized that their plan was beginning to work. It was only nine o'clock on Saturday morning and they'd already gotten a response. Yes, she yelled, nearly jumping for joy. I'm going over to tell Grandpa. Mandy, what if there are any more phone calls? Dr. Emily was drying her hands, following her out. Write down the numbers on that pad, will you, Mom? I'm so thrilled I can hardly wait. She rushed up the lane without a jacket. It was drizzling, but she didn't care. Her grandparents were stacking cans of soup inside the tiny cupboard aboard their camper. Tomato, minestrone, cream of chicken, her grandmother handed them up to her grandfather and ticked them off her list. Can opener, her grandfather popped his head out of the sliding door. He saw Mandy. Hello, sweetie. It worked, it worked, she greeted them. Your brilliant sign, Grandpa, it worked. He rubbed his hands. Mandy's grandparents both stood there in their twin knit sweaters, the drizzle wetting their gray hair. It has? You have a response then? Of course she has a response, haven't you, Mandy? Grandma put in. Come inside, we're all getting wet. Who is it, her grandpa asked as he put on the kettle. Anyone we know? It's someone called Spy. No, Spry. That's it, Miss Marjorie Spry. Grandma shut the kitchen door firmly and wiped her feet. Her head went to one side. The Riddlings, right? Yes, the Riddings. Why, what's the matter? Do you know her? Her grandmother straightened herself up and bustled with the cups and saucers. Yes, she lives at the big house out on Walton Road. Set back from the road, you know, the big old house. I know, Mandy said. They passed it every day on the way to school. It was well away from the traffic and a huge lawn and garden. The perfect place for a cat to live. She wants me to go and see her there at two o'clock this afternoon. Does she now, her grandmother said. That'll be one for the record book. Why? What do you mean? Mandy was nearly bursting with impatience. I thought you'd be pleased. We are, sweetie, her grandfather sued. They don't usually like visitors, that's all, Grandma explained. In fact, I believe the last person they had over their threshold was Mr. Lovejoy, the old pastor before Mr. Walters, and that must be over five years ago. No, Mandy couldn't believe it. Yes, when their father died, the two sisters went into a sort of hibernation. It's true, Grandma insisted. Still, that won't make any difference to you, I don't expect. If Miss Marjorie Spry wants to see you about a kitten, and she's asked you to come over, you go see her. She patted Mandy's hand. They're harmless, a bit peculiar, but harmless enough. Anyway, it's best to check these places before you send these precious kittens off to their new homes, her grandfather agreed. You have to see if they're the right sort of thing. Mandy nodded, but she refused to give up hope. Take someone along with you, her grandfather suggested, just to be on the safe side. James will come with me, Mandy said. She lifted a cardboard box full of bread, cornflakes, milk, and margarine. 
where do you want me to put these? Together they finished packing for the Great Trial Run, as her grandfather called it. He meant their first expedition in their new camper. Finally, they were ready. Map, Grandpa said, climbing into the driver's seat. Map, Grandma produced it from the glove compartment. He turned on the windshield wipers. Rubber boots, raincoats, rain hats? Grandma flipped the map at him. Ready, she laughed. They waved to Mandy, to sunny Scarborough, she cried. Mandy watched them disappear into the drizzle. There were still four hours to go before the visit to the rid Riddings. She would call James to arrange to meet him, then fill up the morning with little jobs at Animal Art, and of course, by riding over to feed Walton and the kittens. Two o'clock came at last. They arrived to find the front lawn of the Riddlings spread out like a soccer field. James and Mandy decided to leave their bikes at the gate. I wonder who cuts this grass, James said. It went in neat strips, light and dark. The edges were neatly clipped. I do, an ancient man in corduroy trousers growled at them from behind a laurel hedge. He was bent almost double, probably from years and years of clipping the edges of huge lawns, Mandy guessed. Have you come about a kitten? He growled again. They nodded. Miss Marjorie warned me about it. Jeffrey, she said, show that girl up to the door. So I'm following orders. This way, he trudged ahead of them up the gravel driveway. The house was as big as a hotel, built of stone with pointed towers at each corner, it was covered in ivy. Though they passed it every day, James and Mandy could truly say that they never really paid much attention to it. It had arched windows, stone pillars, and massive steps up to a wide front door. Like a setting for a horror film, Maddie whispered nervously. Just when they felt they needed him most, their guide left them. This is as far as I ever go. Ring three times, he said. Nice and loud now, you might have to wait. And he went off, bowed and grumbling, to mow the lawn. They looked at each other, shrugged, then James rang the bell. Silence. He rang again and again. Finally, someone began rattling locks on the other side of the massive door. Wait, a tiny voice ordered. What do you think we're doing, James whispered to Mandy, trying not to laugh. Shh, Mandy said. They had to be on their best behavior. But even Mandy couldn't stop her jaw from hanging wide when the door finally creaked open. The hall was the size of a ballroom all in pink marble with dark wood panels and glass chandeliers, but it was dull with age and gray with years of neglect. What had once been as splendid as a fairy tale had now decayed. Yes, a lady stood before them, her stick-like arms and legs poked out from the moth-eaten cream silk robe. She peered at them like a bat in the light. Miss Spry, Mandy said uncertainly, a loud voice would have knocked the old lady down flat, she was sure. Yes, she blinked her watery gray eyes. A skinny hand clutched the neck of her robe. We don't see visitors, she chattered. Mandy's grandmother had been right. No one had come to this place for years. Curtains were closed to keep out the daylight. A collection of odd blue and white china ornaments cluttered the window sills. Great piles of yellow newspapers were heaped on shelves. Miss Marjorie Spry, Mandy repeated, her heart sinking as her eyes took in the mess. Joan, I'm Joan, the woman shrieked. She began to close the door on their faces, but it was big and heavy. They saw the figure of another thin little woman come hurrying downstairs. Come in, come in, the second person ordered in a thin voice. She was beckoning to them, half running across the hall. They've come about the kitten, Joan. Now open the door at once. And there they stood. Two ladies, thin as sticks, wild-haired, in matching silk robes. They had the same sharp face. They had movements that mirrored each other and voices that echoed and mocked. Identical twins, Miss Joan and Miss Marjorie Spry. We don't want visitors, the first one, Miss Joan repeated with a bird-like twitch of her head. Yes, we do. I invited them, Miss Marjorie argued. I want a kitten for this dreadful old place. I want to bring some life in here. Miss Joan stared stubbornly, silently back at her, her sister. Her hand stayed poised to slam the door shut. 
I do, Joan. I'm tired of living in this old museum of a place. I want some life. We're not old yet. Let's make a fresh start, Miss Marjorie pleaded. Look, this girl is advertising kittens, so let her in. At last, Miss Joan gave way. Fascinated, Mandy and James stepped inside. To them, it seemed like actually stepping into the past, into a kind of prison. Miss Joan pushed the door closed after, after them. It shut with a dull, heavy click. What kittens, Miss Joan challenged. She looked her sister in the face. Who told me anything about a kitten? I told you, Miss Marjorie snapped. The sign in the post office, Welford, 703267. But I don't like kittens, Miss Joan protested. You know that. Mandy stood in the middle of their argument, her heart sinking right into her shoes by now. Miss Joan would never give in over this. Anyway, who'd want to leave a kitten where it wasn't wanted 100% by everyone in the house? She looked at James and could tell he thought the same. They both sighed. They watched as Miss Marjorie grew more and more angry. How do you know you don't like kittens? Her eyes seemed to spark. Have you had one? Have you ever owned a cat in your entire life? Have you? Have you? She turned to face Mandy and James, smoldering with rage. I like cats. Joan likes cats, though she says she doesn't. She only says it to be difficult. Yes, you do, she snapped at her twin. She's just a spoiled sport. It's because it's my idea to bring a kitten to the Riddlings to help bring this place back to life a bit. She says no to all my ideas. She nearly cried with exasperation. The tiny twins stood face to face like featherweight boxers. Anyway, I'm the older twin, Miss Marjorie said grandly, and I have decided, don't listen to her. Well, they're still very young, Mandy began to explain. We're only trying to find suitable homes for them in the future, you see. Still, she couldn't settle those doubts about this being a good place to bring one of her precious kittens. Where is it? The older twin began poking at Mandy and James as if a kitten might be hidden in one of their pockets. She's still with her mother. We're just starting to look, as I said. Not here? You haven't brought it with you, Miss Marjorie said sharply. Ha, 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 Miss Joan sang out. She did a little dance of delight. Ha, ha, ha. Miss Marjorie's then patience finally snapped. Quiet, she bellowed. She picked up an old black umbrella from the stand and launched it like a javelin at her noisy sister. It missed by miles, but Miss Joan froze on the spot. Then she grabbed a newspaper from a shelf and rolled it up like a baseball bat. James and Mandy stood with their mouths open. Who would believe this? Let's stop right there. Wow. <laughs> what? What an experience for Mandy and for James. Um, and they're just trying to find a home for the kittens. We'll check on it tomorrow. Thank you so much, second graders. Take care. Bye now.